All right, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B and I am your host for today's program on stalactites and stalagmites in relation to the global flood. I have fan favorites, John Mackay, the creation guy, and Indiana Joe Hubbard from the creation research team here with me today to discuss this important topic. Gentlemen, thank you again for giving us your time for today's important show. And the first question I want to ask is how you been and uh, what's new with the creation research team? Okay, well, uh, being the guy right down under, I'm the bottom of the world as far as you guys are concerned. Perhaps I'd better go first. It is good to see you again. It's been quite a while. Uh, I think we did flood boundaries and things like that last, and it was a mammoth show, but a great one. This is a uh, small specialised area, but a very important one because it's tourist attractive, right? And we'll get onto that lately, uh, a little later. Just to show you some of the things that I've been doing, I've got a, a couple of show and tells. I know, Donnie, you always like the show and tells, correct? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We don't have George here tonight, so there's no funny to show and tell about <laughs> fixing water pipes or something down in Victoria. Okay, show and tell wise, we've spent the last few days getting our trilobite display ready. I mean, when you have a look at this, look at the beautiful eye stalks, right? These are magnificently preserved because undeniably they were buried rapidly before any bits could actually fall off. So that's one. When you have a look at this, Yes, we have thousands of trilobites. Some we found ourselves, some we purchased, and some we swapped. Because like Joe in the UK, and he'll tell you more about that, we're getting ready for our big um, museum. Yeah, we've already got a 10 hectare museum, which deals with uh, you know outdoor displays and things like that. Uh, and this next one is uh, in-house in a building one where they can come along, they can see all the dinosaur bones we've found, they can see the trilobites and all those sort of things. But more about that later. You see, what I'm going to do first is uh, prove that I listened to my uh, coach on how to run this thing. So I'm going to go to some PowerPoints to show you a little bit of history of what we've been doing since we saw you last. OK, now my instructor said press Windows, then share. And we should have us up. Look, there we are. I've You're learned good. well. So I still have a brain. I can still use it. In fact, that's one of the best evidences man was made in God's image. We create these. I mean, I made that, that PowerPoint. I created an illustration. But it's not going to be the made up ones that I'm going to show you today. I'm going to actually take you on a trip. OK, so let's go to the desert. We're on the border of South Australia and outback New South Wales. As you can see, our roads are not surfaced. Where are we heading? We're heading out to do some research on the edge of the desert. We're in the middle of a river. Yes, a very wide river. I'm halfway across. And what's interesting, of course, is I'm digging in the sand. Uh, it had rained the, a couple of days earlier, so the sand was still moist. So it was interesting enough to be able to dig holes. But as you can see, it's cold for an Aussie from Queensland. Oh, the hole when it was finished, here we are. Look at that. Nice sides. Can you see the lines in there? Can you see the layers? Well, we dug up quite a few holes across that mildly moist sand that held itself together. And here's my colleague from the mines down there. And he and I were showing that a phenomena which we've seen in rivers in the Grand Canyon, we've seen it in our strata machine, actually is in the real world at even the smallest level. Can you see the layers in the sand? Now, the interesting thing, of course, is we check with the locals, we check with the train drivers, we check with those who drive across this creek all the time. Do you want to know something interesting? Does that sand match the results of our strata machine, which is designed to produce layer upon layer upon layer? in a flood base. The water is pouring in from one side, going across the strata machine and making layers, flat layers, curved layers, all sorts of layers. You've seen some of our machine. OK, do you know what the local said? The local land agent responsible for a huge area said that stream either floods or it doesn't flow at all. What's the maximum length of the flood? 
two days and the sand is picked up, shifted and dumped. So all the layers you saw are the result of the same phenomena as we have in our strata machine. Our strata machine forms layers sideways. In fact, when you have a look at a bigger version, our strata machines that we've worked with over the years form layers just like in that stream. So the strata machine is not just an abstract little toy, it matches reality. And when you chop it in half, I'm sure that brings to mind a certain part of the world. You see it's right there. And I've shared with you before, I still remember the day my lecturer in geology at Queensland University said, we have a problem, chaps. The rocks in the Grand Canyon formed sideways, not the bottom layer first, not millions of years of slow deposition, which is the basis for millions of years of evolution. It was not a vertical process based on time. It was a horizontal process. Now, can I encourage you to think this one through? Because most of us are still afflicted by the shake up the little jar, the sand and the mud and, and the pebbles will fall out one on top of the other. That has nothing to do with a world which doesn't shake up and down. You see, forming strata is not the result of time. That stream, all those horizontal layers didn't form one on top of the other, but in a maximum of two days of a stream in which the water is already in layers. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's not the evidence which contradicts the word of God, but the beliefs of Nicholas Steiner, who said the bottom layer gets there first. Now, he was a creationist, but he got it wrong. We can all get it wrong. You see, the word of God said God made the world in just six days, and we'll talk more about that later. The word of God says it was created, and the word of God says there was a massive flood that didn't last for millions of years. Okay, now, let me give a slight warning here because quite a few of our viewers have watched some of our programs and said, oh, we stick with such and such because they believe the layers form from the bottom to the top. And they're all creations. But then so is Nicholas Stina, and it turns out he was wrong. Oh, and in that stream, hey, come with me if you want to find some gemstones. Aren't those garnets lovely? No, not high-grade gemstones, but beautiful for your collection. And look at this that I bought home. You see, we not only have an outdoor museum, 10 hectares, 22 acres, for those of you in the old imperial system still, but look at that, one of the rare crystalline forms of lead. Yes, there's big copper and lead mines and silver mines there, and all on its way back to Jurassic Ark, where we even have living gems. There's Daryl shifting one of our spiny anteaters, our echidnas, out of the road of the trucks and that. Yes, we have done a lot of work in the past year or so. April last year, we started this shed. Um, can I encourage you? Never give up. There's a Bible verse that says, he that endures to the end, that's the person will be saved. We lost our previous covers there, just tent type ones that blew down in a massive storm. So build solid. Uh, April 2021, now we're looking at April 2022. Can you see the big gap in the middle? Well, the good news is, folks, when you visit Jurassic Ark, this gap is now filled in and the whole cover for our fossil deposit, world-class fossil deposit, there's yours truly, protected by the lovely shade from the skin cancer-inducing sun of southeast Queensland and even our volunteers last Monday. No, it's not a convict team. It's a group of students who come up quite regularly and they help us excavate some of the massive fossil logs that are in the deposit. And uh, the students get to benefit too. We had two high school classes there on Monday and they helped us open up a new section for students to dig in. Uh, you see, we've done an underground radar survey here and in this little block, we have 10,000 logs fossilized at least. I mean, look at some of the fossils at the bottom. Look at these, I mean, these Jurassic beds are massive. And we've been collecting uh, a lot of our fossils, getting them polished, just to show one thing. The Jurassic rocks all around the world, the Jurassic rocks at Jurassic Ark, tell us, and the world experts, uh, that they reached this conclusion ages ago. When I was a student, they were saying this, the tree rings in the petrified wood in the Jurassic tells us the world used to have a nice, even climate. No harsh summers, no cold winters, even moist, warm. 
Well, can I encourage those of you listening who are in Australia, come and have a look. In fact, you can even come, Donnie, get a plane ticket. Now, I believe you actually can do that from Canada. On the 24th of September, from 10.30 onwards, we have our open day. First, first real opportunity in three years to show our supporters what we've been doing with their money. But what we haven't been doing is labelling our toilets this way. You see, I'm going to hand over to Joe soon to tell it, let him tell you what he's been doing. I couldn't believe the effect of gender-free world is having on public toilets. Now, I wonder which customers regard themselves as mice. I wonder which customers regard themselves as rats. Funny enough, most of the men went in the rat's toilet and most of the mice went, oh, the women, I mean, they went in the mice toilets. Interesting how we've been pandered to by literature. But how would you cope with this one? Just in case you're transgender or confused a little, the men and the women can use the same drops. Oh, amazing. Uh, that, that'll come up later, I'm sure, in questions because it's only a week since the woke archaeologist said you can't assign sex to a fossil skeleton or to an archaeological skeleton because you don't know what it thought, what gender it thought it believed to. Now, Joe, I'm going to put you up there. I'm going to stop sharing here and hand over to you. And you've got some show and tell, as, as well as some great news on what's been happening in England. To make sure I'm uh, muted there, lovely. Yes, I have indeed. We've got a load of uh, rather exciting news. I have to admit, I'm feeling pretty weary. That's only partially because it's about 11 o'clock at night, getting on for half past 11 o'clock at night. But it's also because we've pretty much uh, been non-stop for the last week and a half, nearly two weeks. Uh, and it's uh, not showing any signs of slowing down anytime soon. I do have some nice show and tell. Let's just hold up this uh, lovely thing from our museum collection here. Um, it's actually part of what we're talking about this evening, or it's connected to what we're talking about this evening. This is a rather large stalactite. Um, our stalactites are the ones that hang down. Stalagmites are the ones that grow up. Um, when I was... Uh, growing up and starting geology the way that I was taught you remember them is that stalactites hang down because they might one day touch the floor. Um, so that stalactites are, see, I'm saying I can't even get it messed up now. St stalactites are the ones that hang down because you have to hang on tight to the ceiling. Stalagmites grow up because they one day might touch the ceiling. So it's the stalactites that hang down, stalagmites that grow up. This is a stalactite. But in particular, the reason why we've brought it uh, to show you today, if I can get it into focus, is this little section just down here. Let's hold it a little bit closer. There we go. Now, this little section down here is actually quite important, and we'll explain a bit more why uh, later, perhaps. But yes, there's plenty that's been going on here. I'm going to just share some slides and run you through uh, a little bit of uh, a background update to what we've been doing. Let's see if this works. It should do. There we go. All right, Creation Research UK. Big announcements, big needs, big future. And you can see me there. Well, I wonder what's uh, that all about. You see, I've also got next to me here a couple of newspapers because Creation Research has been in the newspaper recently. Um, I wonder what that is about as well. Well, we'll come on to that in just a moment. A reminder to everybody, and I don't think we were advertising this the last time that we uh, were on Standing for Truth, but uh, for about... Oh, quite a few years now, we've been planning some form of a fossil convention. I mean, the idea was that we could go out. The idea was that we could do a several days camping. The idea was that every day we could go down onto the beach and do a field trip, actually dig up the evidence for yourself, dig up the fossils for yourself. And we decided to just this year, let's do it and see how it goes. So we have the Rocks Cry Out Fossil Convention based down at uh, the Jurassic Coast in the UK. UK, a fantastic place full of fossils. We've got a wonderful base camp. We've got a wonderful set of uh, speakers for the evening seminars. Our very own Dr. Diane Eager is actually flying over. John Mackay will be Skyping in. We've got a great host of UK speakers as well. And things are looking really, really good for it. So make sure you get on board that. Make sure if you're in the UK and you can come, you come to the Rocks Cry Out Fossil Convention. You can enter the UK now, no issue at all. So 
um, praise the Lord for that and come here if you can, because it's promising to be a rather spectacular time. What have I been doing recently? This is one of the reasons why I'm so tired and it's uh, I could do with a lot more sleep than I'm currently getting. We've just had uh, five days down at a place called Creation Fest, which is in Cornwall. Cornwall is a very popular tourist donation. Creation Fest is a big Christian music festival that happens down there every year. And uh, we had a large museum tent, a museum exhibit, which we had stuff from our museum collection. We were handing out leaflets and tracks, and we had a rave review about one of our most commonly asked questions about creation research track. They said it was the best tract on creation and the gospel they'd ever seen. Um, these were people who were involved in ministry. So that was a really positive thing. But you can see some of the fossils we have set up. We had a pretty big setup in the end, nicely spread out. We even took some of our dinosaurs down with us. We had some uh, museum exhibits set out. We had some fossils and resources for sale set out. Great big casts. I mean, we made sure, and we always make sure, we tell people whether we're dealing with a cast or whether you're dealing with the real thing. Why? Because I was really annoyed the first time that I found out, walking around the Natural History Museum in London's um, dinosaur exhibition, that most of the things in there are fake. They're casts. Oh, they're pretty good casts, but they're casts nonetheless. So we made sure we kept all of our casts, all of our copies out the front and made sure that all the real stuff was inside the tent and made sure people understood that what they were coming into the tent to see, to touch, to feel, to get hold of was actually the real deal indeed. This stuff, uh, living fossils, rapid burial fossil jellyfish, beautiful artifacts as well, and fossils from our museum collection, giant dinosaur eggs, horseshoe crabs, brand new exhibits showing, hey, a tight pipe. I wonder if that has something to do with what we're speaking about tonight, the stalactites and the stalagmites, right? And of course, you might be able to just catch a little glimpse of our big news there, a UK first creation research centre. Interesting. We had resources for sale. We had fossils for sale so you could bring some of your own artefacts back with you. And we even had some dinosaurs there. Oh, but this isn't at Creation Fest anymore. But pray for those who we did engage with at Creation Fest. We engaged with hundreds of people over the time that we were there, had some good conversations, handed out literature, uh, was really challenged some people and encouraged and strengthened others. So pray for everybody that we were able to interact with. It was a great time there, although, you know, early mornings, late nights, the music goes on really, really late and it's big, big thumping bass and not really my kind of music but it was a beautiful and uh, very very profitable time there nonetheless all right what are these dinosaurs doing out here in Oswestry? Oswestry is a little town in Shropshire pretty close to the center of the UK and that's not too far from where I am based well we do have some exciting news coming up we have got our creation research center really starting to take shape now. Creation Research Center, where dragons praise the Lord. A Bible verse straight out of the Bible, by the way. Um, that's your King James Version, because you see, they still use the word dragons in the King James Version, because it was written at a time when people still believed in dragons, and was written at a time before the word dinosaur was invented. Hmm, interesting. Well, here it is. There's the building with all of the concept art. It's a two-story building. And it's got a, an amazing amount of space inside. <clears throat> we have over 20,000 fossils and artifacts, which we're needing to shift into there over the next few days. So pray for strength, pray for encouragement for us, right? We're running a little bit thin at the moment on energy. But nonetheless, the Lord has provided abundantly for us. So thank you all for those who've supported us and uh, been able to uh, well basically enabled us to actually not only procure the building but keep the building and for all of those who helped the creation fest and for all of those who have promised to help over the next couple of weeks as we shift in a vast amount of exhibits into this brand new building beautiful exhibits like giant crinoid sea lilies living fossils no evolution there beautiful rapid burial evidence because well there's no way that this could bury, be buried slowly. And also, what was John talking about earlier? Flowing water depositing things? 
These creatures didn't live, die, and fall down. These creatures weren't swept up in a flood and suspended and then slowly settled down. You can actually see there's flow indication there. This was buried in flowing water. So don't be surprised that all the evidence points, whether it's the fossils or the rock sediment, it all points to being buried in flowing water. Water that is moving in one direction. Water that is flowing sideways, or as we call it, sideways deposition. Go and check out our uh, flood boundary conference. We dealt with that a lot. <clears throat> Great big dinosaurs. People love dinosaurs, kids and big kids. All right. One of the things that I was, uh, well, it was quite amusing was that every young person wanted to have their photograph taken to one of our dinosaurs. And so did most of the dads, right? Great big selfies and all sorts of fun stuff. So dinosaurs really do work. They're fascinating creatures. And we have a whole range of dinosaurs in our museum as well. Beautiful exhibits that are relevant to our topic tonight. Oh, I held up our little stalactite earlier, right? I mean, it's still pretty hefty, right, for a tiled old Englishman, but uh, the one that you can see there on the left-hand side of the picture is significantly bigger. It was a wonderful donation to the ministry, so thank you for the person who enabled us to get that. But it's an enormous six-foot-long stalactite from China. Yeah, stalactite, this thing hangs down or once hung down. Right now it stands upright because it's really about the only thing you can do with it. It weighs an absolute ton. But then on the right-hand side, you see a brand-new fossil or or brand new exhibit rather, um, artifact from our good friend in Canada, Vance Nelson. Uh, where is this originally from? It's originally from the Karlovavari in the Czech Republic. It's a water pipe that over a very short period of time has created beautiful, well, it looks just like a stalactite section, doesn't it? But this happened inside a metal water pipe over a very short period of time. It's a process that counts, nothing to do with time whatsoever. And our Creation Research Centre has some Bible verses that go as a theme. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them, Psalm 111. Yes, we will study the works of the Lord, whether that be his work of salvation and his daily work that he does in us, or whether that be the work of his creation. And we do this research, we study these works of the Lord, and we put them on display. Why? So that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it, Isaiah 41. And then finally, praise the Lord from the earth, you dragons, or you great dragons, says Psalm 148 in the King James Version. Um, it's interesting when you understand a little bit of history and the different Bible translations. So where are we going from here? It's exciting times. We've already kick-started the big move. It's really taking shape and starting to take place next week. We have to set up a museum and a fossil shop inside there, and we will end up Lord willing, with an open day later on this year. Dates for the diary. If you're in the UK, if you have a van or a vehicle, or even if you're just willing to, you know, put some elbow grease into it, we need packers, we need sorters, we need loaders, we need drivers, we need unloaders, we need resorters, we need a lot of help. If you're around in the UK and can offer your services on Thursday the 11th all the way through to Tuesday the 16th, taking a break out for the Lord's Day, of course, if you're around, send us an email. We would love for you to be able to come and help us, and we would greatly appreciate any help that we can get. And thank you very much for those who've already offered to help, including providing vehicles. It really, really does help us. Monday, the 26th of September, we've already mentioned the rocks cry out. Book on it if you can. And then Essentially, for those of you who are listening in the UK, from Monday the 3rd of October onwards, we're going to be organising a big ministry trip around the UK. We haven't quite stretched that internationally yet. Lord willing, that'll happen next year. But we're going to catch up with all the folks in the UK who we haven't seen for years because, uh, you know, COVID and so on and so forth, and it's still been dragging on. So if you're in the UK, Okay, and you want us to come visit your group or church, get in touch. And like I said earlier, Dr. Diane Eager will be coming over at some point in October. So there's a good chance that we'll be able to organize some ministry with her as well. Um, great evidence days. And then finally, on the 29th of October, we will have our museum open day. 
Yeah, 29th of October, uh, full day program, lunch provided, um, booking essential. You can't just turn up, but more details of that will be on the website. So again, if you're in the UK and you want to come see the new birth of a fantastic project here in the Creation Research Centre, you can find out more details online and book that. Well, we've recently just set all this up, right? It's been working quietly in the background for a long while, but it finally went public and uh, the media got hold of it. I mean, originally, my uh, solicitor, business solicitor, who organized all of the legal stuff for me, just wanted a photo, and he put it in his LinkedIn page, and the press got hold of it, and they wanted to do a story. And to be fair, I was actually quite impressed with what they did. I mean, we have the Oswestry and Border Counties Advertiser, which is a local newspaper. He says, have you come across a T-Rex in Oswestry. Um, it was pretty popular when this first came out. But then the one of our biggest uh, local newspapers, regional newspapers, the Shropshire Star got hold of it, and their title was a little bit different. Um, Dinosaurs and fossils are focus at centre. And what's really fantastic is they actually talk about the hmm, creation of dinosaurs. Um, Creation Research UK, it says, wants to show how the Bible fits in with science. I mean, I'm quite impressed that they published some of this stuff, but that they did. Now, as you can quite imagine, um, it's gone down very well with some people, but not quite so well with other people. Um, Here are some of the uh, headlines. New fossil and dinosaur shop and educational centre on its way to Oswestry. And we can see some of the comments from some people. Complete pseudoscience. The Shropshire Star. Uh, Oswestry will teach customers about creation using fossils and dinosaurs. Yes, we will. But some people are not particularly keen of us or our organisation, and they've made some rather strange accusations sometimes, but I wonder if they've actually taken the time to actually find out what we believe. I mean, we will certainly be putting all the evidence up on display. So pray for us. Pray as we uh, continue to set up this project that we will be a shining light in the midst of darkness, but also pray that the Lord will enable us to engage, enable us to, uh, you know, present this evidence, enable us to uh, be gracious as well to all of those who would wish to see us shut down. So I'm just going to finish up about there, and I'm going to finish with just uh, this final little bit, a reminder for anybody in the UK, we need your support. Yes, we don't just need helpers. We don't just need donations. We also need paid people who are good at, uh, you know, um, doing uh, maintenance work, building architects, designers, uh, you know, trade workers, whatever. Uh, we really do need your help. So uh, get in touch with us today. But John, I'm going to finish there. I'm going to stop sharing. And I think it's about time that we hand over to you for uh, your section. Oh, just one second, John. Let me. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Basically, that's great, Joe. Uh, I'm going to do the first of the, the first two sections on evidence. I see we've got some good questions coming in already. Uh, but a- after those two, Donnie, feel free to have a, a great question time and then we'll move on to the last section if, if time allows. And Joseph has to gone to sleep because it's getting on to midnight over in the UK. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. OK, show and tell again. Uh, much of what you are going to see on some of the stalactite experiments are in our book, Tights, Mites and Fossil Fights. So check in your country. It's definitely available in the UK, definitely available in Australia uh, and other countries. So Tights, Mites and Fossil Fights. Joseph and I did that. It's full colour. You'll find the pictures that you like to see online are all in here and they are brilliant evidence to share with your friends. And you may have noticed that people really objected to Joe setting up his museum. But if you read those objections, and you can uh, web search those those newspapers, you find their objections are largely about the fact that we believe the Bible and we make no bones about it. If you want to walk through the world, if you want to walk through um, eternity, then the only way is to walk through Genesis with Jesus from the start to walking through Jesus right to the end of the world. So grab our book, Walking with Jesus Through Genesis, and those two will give you a good bird's eye view of what we're actually doing overall. Now, once I find my cursor, I can bring this down here, prove that I've got a memory. There we are. Do that. Share screen. Share screen and press two, screen two, there we are, and share. 
Okay. So there we, we go. Up, You're a pro, on? John. You're a pro. Okay. I'm getting, I'm doing well. But you see, the fact that we can both talk and remember what we said is one of the evidences we're made in God's image. Uh, I don't want to underplay that. We did not evolve speech. Now, you'll see the title I've given this, Six Days is All You've Got. Now, I struggled with the six-day concept being trained in geology, and I put it aside for a long time. But, of course, I've gradually come to see there isn't any evidence the world is old. There's a lot of beliefs. Uh, one of the beliefs that helps us to realize that things don't take millions of years is in the stalactite and stalagmite section. Why did I pick the term six days and not 50 days? The answer is simple. You see, the Bible, which this whole chapter, read the first chapter talking all about God speaking to Moses. This section does not claim to be authored by Moses. It may be a copy by Moses, but it says the Lord said this. So since it says um, it's all about telling the truth, you can't have a chapter on telling the truth that begins with a lie if God didn't give this to Moses. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Okay, what's the problem? You see, I struggle with that question for years. Why should I even bother with the age of the earth? Um, give me an illustration. I haven't seen a better example on this, and I've shared this all over the place. Joe organized a debate for me against an atheist biology professor, John Turner, leader in his field, and it is available online. There's me, there's him, nice bloke, shorter than the Aussies. But of course, one of the things he said during the debate fell right into our hands. In fact, that's what I find in all debates. We have precious little in the way of intermediates in the fossil record. Now, any of you with good memories will remember Charles Darwin said that, or older language, but in reality, he said, the worst part of my theory is the fossils. There is no evidence. And uh, 200 years later, uh, Professor John says, we've got precious little in the way of intermediates in the fossil record. But the world is so old, evolution must have happened. Now, do you realize they're not even logically connected? If the world is old, why does that mean it wasn't created? I mean, if I find a, a table in my lounge room, I never think, oh, look what the evolution of trees can do. I always know somebody carpentered those wood into a nice table. But the evidence is the same if I investigate the Egyptian pyramids and I find a table crafted by a 3,000-year-old Egyptian woodsman. The evidence for creation has nothing to do with how old the creation is. But you see, the philosophy of the world um, is when time is the hero of the plot, they think they've got rid of God. That was Professor John's philosophy. That's why I was an atheist. Since we know the world is old, there must be no God. Well, what a terrible lack of logic. Now, you can see this on our YouTube you can put yourself on our mailing list. It's free. Those of you who don't get our printed mailing letters, that the latest one has just been put up online. So go to creationresearch.net, search newsletters, and see. We report many of the researches we've done. Like this, uh, Joe and I are actually uh, going to start a new book, uh, hopefully maybe out by the end of the year. Who knows? Joe's so busy, he's up to his eyeballs with a new museum. Not on stalactites, but on layers and liars. But let's start this one as we do with the Strata book, uh, the uh, Stalactite book, Janola and Caves Australia. I first saw this many years ago, and I still have the brochure. It said the cave was 4,000 years old, the year 1963. Yes, ask my wife, I am a hoarder. That's how I know how old this cave brochure said the world was. I throw very few things away. It gets me into heaps of trouble. But you see, I also visited in 2008. We were doing a film on Darwin. And, and go and have a look at our Darwin series, part one, Darwin on the Rocks. We visited this place. We filmed it. The cave, the rocks, regarded now as 400,000 years old. And you went inside, and they showed you big stalagmites and big stalactites. And they said, don't touch them. They take so long to grow. Now, funny thing, when I was uh, back in my teens in 1963, they never told you that. Um, they obviously grew a lot faster in my days. And now the world's gotten so old. What's their logic that the stite types take so long? Well, here it is. Number one, they take so long 
because it's the water dripping through the limestone that gets carbon dioxide that makes mild carbonic acid which dissolves the limestone fairly slowly and you add to that well what do you add to that you see you can't just talk about the stalactites these days you have to talk about the time for the cave to dissolve i mean how can you have a stalactite in a cave unless you have a cave and if the stalactites take so long to form then dissolving the whole cave sometimes kilometers long that the australia's deepest cave has just been conquered a big cave hundreds of meters deep a very slow process they say uh, who says this well have a look we like putting the references in so if you haven't yet got our tights and mites book you can see all of these the time for stalactites are da, 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 a very slow process it's in the counter creationism handbook but can you see who printed it the University of California Press, the people who supposedly are the holders of knowledge and truth. Sometimes caves take tens of millions of years. Now, we, for the first time, I always pondered about stalactites because I saw them grow on my father's. See the water tank at the back? I watched stalactites grow on old tanks because the cement was inside, the lime dissolved, it formed stalactites really quickly. So at Jurassic Arc, we made what well, looks like a giraffe's drinking trough, correct? It was really the world's first external stalactite machine, number one, and it was started in 2015, which is seven years ago. Now, if you come to our open day on the 24th of September, you will notice vast improvements since 2015 yep for the last three years we've hardly had any crowds so we've had plenty of time to actually do things just not much money to do it with there's one of our old supporters fred we've cut a water pipe in two and we've actually filled the bottom with shells why caves are in limestone stalactite grows through the limestone limestone is made of the material that comes from shells okay so here's fred putting crushed dried cement on the top why well cement is made from crushing limestone which is then cooked and drives the water off so the whole lot of this machine is derived from limestone on the right hand side you'll see we put some wicks in there this is to trap the water take it down through the material and see what happens to it but on the top we put my secret ingredient now why did i do this I watched stalactites grow on my dad's tank. I actually had the job of getting inside the old tank and cleaning it out because we would drink the water out of there. And inside was dead frogs, dead lizards, spiders, leaves, and that grew stalactites real well. Then I would go to places that had caves, but there was no water and no plants, no stalactites. Then I would go to caves that had no water today and over the top was beautiful red soil and mulch from previous forests and the stalactites inside were big but they weren't growing hint hint wink wink nudge nudge um put mulch in because i'm pretty sure that what happens in a cave is something like this mulch and plant material the limestone and the seashells and they actually dissolve the mulch and the bacteria in them cause the solution to actually um, get into the water and it will drip out. Oh, stalactite, in case you haven't figured out what these words mean, Joseph gave you the, uh, the commercial trade teachers use. Stalactites hang on tight. Now, a, a total abuse of Greek, of course, but I'll get Joseph trained up right. ITE means thing. Stalact means a drip. Stalactite, uh, not stalactite, stalagmite, stalag with the G instead of the C means a drop. So stalactite is the drip thing, stalagmite is the drop thing. You got it? Now you got, you got that, Joe? Uh, ha have your Greek ready next time. So when we have a look at this, I'm pretty sure that that's what's happening. Now, to actually boast about it, you can go and have a look at the growth rate of cave tights. You can go to commercial caves where they say, don't touch and they take so long. Why don't you ask the guide, have you watched this? Have you measured it? Because to be honest, most of the cave guides are students or the university workers or they're people on the dole and they're just earning a bit of money and they tell you what they've been told. But there's Wiki, that great source of information. Average growth rate, 
of stalactites is 0.13 millimetres or 0.0051 inches a year. No wonder they take vast ages to grow. But what makes them so slow? Because we have our artificial cave here. February the 15th, 2016. We started in October 2015. Ah, look what's happening. Can you see we have stalactites already? And they are not. I mean, we put a date in there because I'll be honest, science can be exciting, but 99% of the time it's sheer boring. We've got to record all the dates. Well, there's our stalactite dripping down on the 15th of February, 2016. What's it made of? Easy to prove. You get a, a beaker full of hydrochloric acid, you make a 3% solution, and you can prove that this is commercial, this is ordinary, this is cave limestone. By the time we get to the 31st of March, just sort of six weeks later, can you see the growth? In fact, we keep records. And I'll be honest, I'm glad I'm a hoarder. I have thousands and thousands of records, not just in my place, not just in my shed, in friend sheds as well. Joseph's benefited from us that in England. So what we can say is there's something wrong with the commercial rate, with the academic rate, with the Wikipedia rate, we were getting one centimetre a month by having water in mulch, which now grows grass, which drips through, taking bacteria down through the rope into the stalactite, and it would grow. Oh, yes, they will sometimes concede that bridges grow stalactites faster. And the fastest one they have on record at the Scripps Science, uh, the J Rank organisation, is 1.6 inches per year. Now, that's much better than cave stalactites, but look, nowhere near as good as ours. 12 centimetres a year, 4.8 inches a year. Now, when you look, what we've done is establish the fact that if you set up an artificial stalactite maker that duplicates exactly what you find in caves, it's made out of the stuff that you get in caves. You actually show that in the wide open spaces, with the worst possible conditions, wind comes along, birds go through it, idiots use, I mean, they get close to take a photograph and their hat knocks off the end. I confess, I broke the first one. It should be two or three times as long as it is, but it's been broken three times. Now, Joe's going to give an interesting insight on what's actually out there in reality, because he had a holiday uh, in a place that opened his eyes to the actual rate of stalactite and stalactite formation. And after that, we might get Donnie to uh, uh, give us a question time or two. So I'm going to stop sharing here, Joe. You can take over for sort of uh, part B of our first segment. And uh, that okay with you, Donnie? Absolutely. That sounds great to me. Yeah, great Joe. for me as well. I'm just trying to make sure that I uh, get my screen up correctly, which it looks like it is. And we're going to start with the Bible verse. Test all things, hold fast to what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Um, it's a fantastic piece of advice, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a Christian, whether you're just a, or, you know, anybody. It's a great piece of advice straight out of Scripture. But for those of you who are Christians, this is something that God is actually commanding you to do. Test all things, only hold fast to that which is good. Um, let's do some testing. Let's go to Saigon Copper Mines. Where is Saigon? Because we do have an international audience tonight. Well, there's the United Kingdom, uh, or technically the British Isles, as is shown there. And uh, you can see Wales on the, uh, well, Wales is the part that the arrow is pointing to, but specifically the part that the arrow is pointing to is round, roundabout in Wales, where Saigon Copper Mines is. Um, there is the mine. You do have to crouch down. You do have to go inside. It's all very adventure. -y. It's all very fun. Uh, you see all the ferns and everything growing around. And really, you can start to see as you enter the mine, the first little indication that there might be something interesting inside there. You see the little stream that's running out of the mine on the right hand side. You see what color it is. A rusty red. Um, in fact, it's not surprising that it's rusty red because that is indeed rust that is actually uh, at the bottom of that little stream there. You carry on through. I mean, this was a number of years back, but that's actually quite significant because you will find that uh, a number of years back is when we took this evidence 
and actually handed it over to John. And John took that evidence and actually developed it at his Jurassic Ark Museum. Um, this was a few years back, so we're digging through the cave, we're digging through the mine. This is all a mine, this is all artificial. This is not a natural cave. It's natural rock and it's been blasted through it and the mine has been abandoned for a little while. And you have beautiful great big stalactites. Stalactites, yes John, I'll get it right this time, the drip drip. And they were certainly drip dripping, right? In fact, uh, as we cycle through some of these slides, you may even see the drip drip drip, right? A beautiful great big stalactites that have grown in this abandoned mine and they're just almost iridescent almost gleaming shiny beautiful great big things and you have great big growths on the side of the wall as well as that runs down the side of the cave and deposits all this material beautiful great big veils huge thick great big curtains of this stalactite stalagmite material um stalagmite oh yes you can see it down there it's building itself up and you can even see some of the drops that the um that the uh, the water is left uh, the, the droplets have left in the water there and then you find stalagmites the ones that grow upwards and it was really difficult to get context for this because this was a zoomed up photo that was sort of at the top of a ledge but this stalactite was around eight foot tall that's two and a half meters in metric so these are big things some of the stalactites that were hanging down were up to two meters in length as well uh, somewhere between six and eight feet they're pretty big. These are not little spindly things. These are pretty big, chunky stalactites and stalagmites. And then I began to notice something even more interesting. Uh, you see the electrical wire? You see what's growing over the electrical wire? Hey, we've got some rather beautiful stalagmites, the ones that grow upwards, right? Um, yeah, they've been drip, drip down from above and drip, drip onto them. And you've got this beautiful formation, which is forming on the side of the wall and falling down to the base of the floor. And it's growing up over the electrical wires. Interesting. You can find more of this all along the cave. The electrical wires were being completely covered up by this stalactite and stalagmite formation. And you read the information boards because, yes, this is a, a, you know, a public tourism area. You can go walking through it yourself. Uh, go visit it if you're in Wales one day. Have a look at what it says in the English translation. There are no natural caverns. The stalactite and stalagmite formations have grown since these mine workings were abandoned. There's approximately 850 feet of rock above and the workings go down for another 150 feet. And I thought, well, that's a very interesting piece of information. We know that all of these formations, all of these stalactites, stalagmites, all of the things that form on the side of the cave walls have all formed since the mine workings were abandoned. Of course, the question is, when were the mine workings abandoned, right? Um, the sign didn't actually tell you that. So I had to go out and find the curator of this museum because this is a privately owned place. The land and the mine is all privately owned. They've opened it up as an attraction. And I went and found the curator and had a bit of a discussion with him. And it turns out I got a bit more than I bargained for because <laughs> he uh, basically gave me a rundown of the history of the mines when they first had electricity installed um, back in the 1980s. And then there was a great big issue when everything turned over to metric and they had to strip out all the electrics and redo it. And it cost him a load of money and all this kind of stuff. Right. And you'll find that the mine was abandoned in 1903. In other words, all of those stalactite and stalagmite formations had formed in just 114 years. But the important part, which comes to the electrical wires, the brand new electrics were fitted in 2000. And at the time that we visited in 2017, there had been 17 years to produce that material over that new wiring. Just 17 years. Of course, it's been probably grown on a lot more now in 2022. And uh, I'd like to go back this year and see what has happened over the last 22 years. Um, 
watch this space. I'm sure we'll have some updates soon. In fact, I'd love to do a stalactite and stalagmite or a titan might field trip uh, where we actually start at our new museum building with our wonderful collection and a stalactite machine. We go down to where well, we might get on to later, Church Canal Tunnel and some of the stalactites that are in there. Um, we might not, but we'd go down there and then we'd finish up in Saigon and actually have a look at these rather wonderful stalactites and stalagmites. And it all makes one important point. It's got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. With the process right, it happens quickly. You've got evidence of that. 113 years uh, to produce all of it, just 17 years to cover up all the electrics. Well, let's give you one more location and then probably a break for questions because John Mackay is going to take us on to our next segment, which is a direct resulting experiment from what we found here. There's our map of the British Isles again, Great Britain there in the middle, and you can see down in Essex near Colchester in the UK, I was on another family holiday. Oh yeah, we'd been on family holidays and we've been going on family holidays for the sole purpose of looking for fossils and digging up fossils since, uh, well, getting on for nearly 10 years ago, right? We've been doing this. Um, things, times have moved on a bit from then, but this was not a family holiday that we were actually going looking for fossils or anything like that, right? I had a great childhood digging up fossils and everything, but this was not supposedly one of them. This, we were staying at a campsite called Wheelie Bridge down in Essex near Colchester and we'd been driving in and out of well in order to get into the campsite you had to go under a bridge I mean that's why it's called Wheelie Bridge it's nice and simple right and as we were driving in and out of the bridge I happened to look up one night and I shouted stop and I had to sort of peel dad from the roof of the van because he thought there was something wrong and I had to explain to him no there wasn't anything wrong I'd seen something rather interesting this is what I'd seen underneath the bridge as we drove through. Oh, this was the year before we found Saigon Copper Mines. This was in 2016. Wheelie Bridge, Colchester, Essex, and here it is. You can just start to see, perhaps on that photo, what's really interesting. You see, this is what I'd spotted. I'm pulling a funny face there because I was staring into the sun. This was sort of late in the afternoon, right? And I'd noticed some rather interesting things growing at the top of this bridge. Stalic tights hanging down from the big old railway concrete bridge interesting and there they were i mean maybe you've got questions about well surely these uh you know concrete stalactites are not the same as cave stalactites well that's a th subject for the q a session but that's not the point of these this is have a look at what was growing out of the old drainage pipe. This was the drainage pipe where all the leaves and the muck and the sort of gunge uh, uh, collected at the top of the railway tracks and the water soaked down through this mulch and drained out into the little river below. And look what was growing out of this rather large drainage pipe. A really big, thick, chunky stalactite. I mean... This isn't a long little spindly thing like you sometimes find at the, uh, you know, caves. This is a big, chunky, meaty stalactite, pretty thick. Pretty long as well, about 19 centimetres, but really thick and round. Well, we collected some of the uh, stalactites and stalagmites that you could find underneath this bridge. We did an acid test. It's a very simple test with some hydrochloric acid. Just add a bit and it froths and bubbles all over the place. And the hydrochloric acid test proves that this is indeed a, pro uh, a, a, a mineral known as calcium carbonate. Now, that's important for later on. Uh, this is my brother, and he had found other drainage pipes with slightly smaller ones growing out of them. But look at what he's pointing to down below. A little stalagmite that is beginning to grow up from the floor. In fact, this is the one underneath that big chunky stalactite. It was a huge stalagmite, um, pretty round. In fact, it was uh, getting on for about four feet across. Pretty large, wonderful formations as the stalactite is drip, drip, dripping down and producing this rather beautiful formation. And then I noticed something rather interesting. And this is where the research gets important because this is where the inspiration came from for what John is going to talk about next. Um, what am I pointing to? Can you see it now? Let's put the outline around it. 
It's a leaf, a leaf that has got caught up and trapped in this static type material and has become, well, some people don't like us using the word fossilized, but one thing it certainly has become is permineralized. Now, permineralization is a form of fossilization that is recognized in the fossil record. And yes, we've done tests. You can take these leaves, you can break it open. It's not just coated. In many cases, these have become fully impregnated with minerals and they are indeed a fossil leaf. There were several others of them. In fact, they've become so impregnated, they were pretty fragile. They didn't just have a layer that could come off. It was actually the whole leaf fully impregnated with minerals, permeated with minerals, hence permineralization. You can do, we collected some samples, do the hydrochloric acid test. It shows it certainly is calcium carbonate, shows it's calcium carbonate all the way through. What's the importance? Wheelie Bridge, built 1930. The stalactites and the fossil leaf layers at the time we visited in 2016 were 86 years old maximum. Maximum being the important word. But you might have questions about, well, how did these leaves get trapped in here in the first place? Did somebody place them there? Did somebody glue them down there? What's going on here? Well, it's this research which inspired a brand new set of experiments at Jurassic Arc, but that's for John to explain about in the next session. But for now, I'll stop sharing uh, screen and John, back over to you. Well, George, uh, Thank you. I'll throw it out to you for a short question time and then we'll move on to the next segment. All right, gentlemen, as always, very comprehensive. I really do appreciate it. So many awesome events coming out of the creation research team as well. So I appreciate that. God bless the work that you uh, that you brothers are doing. I do want to uh, remind the audience, I've got George Bond in the chat. He's been periodically uh, posting the links, the relevant links to your websites and where, uh, you know, the audience can support uh, the work being done through the creation research team. So I really do appreciate it. And lots of prayers going out to you guys, John Mackay and Joe. So we've got, we got a lot of questions. So I've been having a hard time keeping up with this live chat <laughs> as always. Um, it's very lively. So why don't we, um, okay, here's one <clears throat> that's relevant. So this one comes in from John B. And he asks, my question is why, are you all talking about artificial speleothem growth? Hopefully I pronounced that somewhat right. In non-cave environments, the kinetics and chemistry are all different. Uh, any any resp responses, gentlemen? Yeah, first of all, uh, it's sorry to say this. I don't mean it harshly, but it's an <laughs> ignorant statement that the chemistry is different. The chemistry is identical. The result, we've had them X-ray diffraction done on the stalactites, on the material that's coming from, and it is identical. Go and do it for yourself. The kinetics uh, is, is not exactly the most relevant thing here because I got a phone call from a professor at uh, Bendigo University who was interested in our research and their field was geography and, and all of the cave formations through South Australia there. And we have one famous cave area, the Nullarbor, which I've th visited, I've filmed. If you want to see yours truly jumping into a cave to find a big fossil, uh, go and look at our Darwin on the Rocks series. You will see the fossils that are formed in this, the stalactites, the caves, etc. Most of them are now dry, right? They are not growing stalactites. You will go to the caves, the tourist versions, and they'll tell you how long the stalactites take to grow. But of course, once we set up our experiments that were duplicating the chemistry of the caves, producing the identical chemistry of the stalactites, the X-ray diffraction of the calcium carbonate is identical. So they're not all different. And secondly, you will find that this professor was really interested and phoned up and said, guess what, John? I said, what? They said, we opened up a new parking area in the Nullarbor region, and we've sort of leveled the plane out and we've put new grass down for the tourists, make it, you know, a brand new opening, make it look really good. And we've watered the grass because it's a fairly dry area. And they said, surprise, surprise, the water from the local reservoir on the grass through the limestone has kick-started the stalactites all over again. Grass, limestone, stalactites growing. That's what our experiment is about. The fact that it's outside a cave only tells you if we can do it outside a cave, inside a cave, it'll go, do much faster. And that's what the professor said. 
the rate of growth with the grass plus the, the water through the limestone is incredibly high. And what you need to think through here, when you look at the kinetics of the chemistry, CO2 plus H2O gives mild carbonic acid. It doesn't make Ks, uh, it doesn't make stalactites grow very fast at all. Having discussed our conclusions that it's not just the water, it's not just the CO2, it's bacteria as well that adds a living element to this, which increases the rate at which the stalactites can grow. In fact, we went to St. Andrews University to share with one of the professors there who had been doing similar research, but in a totally different area, had never even thought of applying it to caves. But it turns out that the bacteria we were working with can produce a chemical which is unbelievably acidic, sort of minus two on the pH scale, can chew out caves. And I said, if you had a whole raft of vegetable matter in Noah's flood with a bacterial growth like you can't believe, um, could you chew out a cave? He said, no trouble at all. This, this acid is unbelievable in, in its absolute strength. Make caves, dissolve lime. And so into your kinetics and chemistry, you need to throw a biological component and you'll make caves. You'll make stalactites really quickly. So thank you for your question. We thought it through and it's absolutely relevant to young earth situation because, I mean, what did the professor say? The world is so old that it, it, it must have evolved based on absolutely no observation whatsoever. He's never seen a cave form. He's never seen stalactites form. He's never even thought about the biology of bacteria involved in this. He's treated it straight as slow chemistry. And if all you use is chemistry, sorry, wrong process gives you the wrong time. Joe, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just add to that, that the reminder of what we keep saying over and over again with what we deal, you know, whenever we're dealing with any of these topics, it's about process, not time. I mean, one of the things I've just seen in the comments there is that um, – you don't need vegetation in order to for them to grow. Well, okay, that may well be true, but the point is if you take that assumption, you'll end up with them taking vast ages to grow, and that is correct, right? But if you add vegetation to it, one thing that we've seen over and over again is when the biological presence is involved in these uh, splenotherms or stalactites or stalagmite formations, the rate of formation increases massively. You see it in every single experiment we do, including ones when we remove any form of artificial uh, concrete or limestone. Yeah, it's easily done. You get rid of any form of, uh, you know, um, well, basically criticism that it's the limestone or from the concrete that's actually producing these, right? You can completely remove it. You certainly can replicate a cave. In fact, it was about as close as a cave as you could get with the mining, right? The only artificial thing that was in place there was the thing that blew the, the hole in the first place. Well, that doesn't explain why you get such an increased of these um, growths, right? So what you'll find is that when you add that vegetation, when you take that perspective, these things can grow quickly. And what it does show you is that it's a process. Get the right process, it happens quickly. Get the wrong process, it certainly will take millions of years. Um, but it's a process nonetheless. Very good, very good as always, uh, gentlemen. So next question comes in here from T-Rock. And he asked, question for John, is it conceivable that the cavity of the cave isn't primarily formed by erosion, but by gaseous bubbles from heat or chemical reactions collapsing or escaping? Okay, you will find that most cave interiors show definite evidence of water being involved as opposed to big gas bubbles that will come up, say, from methane or something and are doing their best gravitationally to escape. Now, undeniably, I've visited caves which are really the result of collapse. We can't figure out exactly what caused the collapse. It's not a collapse. You know, many caves will collapse as they get so close to the surface, the weight of the rock just caves in. There's nothing above it to hold it up. And you see some of those in Tennessee particularly, and they are really good places to go looking for where the oil gets trapped. There's big cavities in there. The oil is in there. Ghost dig your stick in there and extract the oil and become a millionaire, particularly with the price of gasoline, what it is at the present day. Um, but you'll find that there is very limited evidence that the cave has forced its way to the surface by a big gas bubble. Now, you can actually go underwater as well into coral reefs and see caves. Uh, the caves are growing stalactites. So when you think 
it's just the water and the co2 sorry marine caves and coral reefs blow your theory out of the water quite literally and neither do you see big bubbles coming up through there or even gas leaking out so you have to deal with not only the terrestrial caves but the underwater caves which in salt water grow stalactites which can't be due to co2 plus water so get a bigger picture guys hope that's helpful absolutely always helpful um unless joe you wanted to add anything i can go to the next question uh gentlemen now i move on to the next next question then back over to john for the uh the next part okay um okay i'm just looking through these ones and deciding which one to there's one there george that uh, i've been to on hawaii which will probably be helpful to this tape because it involves a cave okay um, right okay. is it this one from iron mat Yep, that's it. That's it. There, there you go. Okay, now, some of you know we've done videos that are now DVDs, which are now available as downstreaming MP4s, all those sort of things. So go to creationresearch.net, download The Origin of the Races, search for uh, Real Roots, etc., and the Darwin series, and you'll see a lot of this in live film where we went there to check it out. Now, one reason I went to the big island of Hawaii, where your biggest mountain is, Mauna Kea, right? which goes way up into the sky. And if you want some good exercise, walk up to a cave. It's about 12 and a half, 13,000 feet. So a good, jolly good day's walk up there and back again. And then ask the locals what they called the cave. The cave is Pue Lili No. Um, it's actually on many maps still. And the translation, the cave of Mrs. Noah. Yes, they had that name before the missionaries got there. And if you tell the locals, hey, the height of that mountain denies there was a worldwide flood, you will insult their culture. Why? Because they say the mountain was there and the big raft landed up the top, uh, a big canoe rather, and they got off and Mr. and Mrs. Noah settled in this cave. And all the people came down the mountain and we're the first. I hate to say it, but most of our races, whether we're European or non-European, we boast about us being the first nation or the first people. You see it, Donnie, and the people in the Grand Canyon, where they have a big log story, a flood story, a global flood, and they got off the log in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and we're the first people. We're the first nation. The people in Hawaii would not agree with anyone who said those mountains are too high for there have been to a global flood because it's built into their traditions. Now, not based on observation, because you and I know the evidence shows they didn't get to the Hawaiian chain and on to New Zealand till the 12, 1300s. They sailed out from Asia, checked their DNA, checked their culture, and you'll find they arrived there fairly late in history and they adapted the story of Noah to fit their local circumstances. But we all tend to do that. But what you find is having a volcanic mountain is not a dispute with Noah's flood because most of the volcanoes are post-flood. The big tall ones are post-flood. They bubbled out of the ground and they probably started at the end of the flood where they were sealing up the fountains of the deep. In fact, if you look at the native stories of the origin of those complete island chains, and it continues down to New Zealand, they are all about the volcanoes moving, forming, sinking, moving, forming, sinking, almost our version of uh, continental drift or, or island drift, if you like, that the original volcano is still there, it just sank. Another one pops up, another one pops up. So these are most probably ceilings of the fountains of the deep and the cracks that appeared in the Earth's surface from the end of the flood up to the present day, and many of them are still actually growing. You don't want to be in some of the Hawaiian Islands when those volcanoes go off. So uh, as much as it's an interesting thought, the locals would treat you as destroying their culture. B, there is no evidence that the flood ever had to get that high for one reason. You see, if those volcanoes can grow and sink, then you have no idea how tall they were at the end of Noah's flood or whether they were even there. The flood involves the water coming up as well as the land coming down. And the end of the flood involves the land coming up as well as the water coming down. So build that into your picture. Joe, any comments? No, I think that was pretty good. Just, uh, yeah. You've okay, been well, there, so that, that, makes it, that makes it better. That's the benefit. Yeah. I'll, I'll move on to the second section now, George. 
Uh, that'll make it easier. Not George, sorry. Uh, George, you're having a holiday today. Uh, we haven't received a funding from you yet. We've been really, really demure here. Okay, we've just <laughs> got our questions. So I'll reshare my screen. Okay, come on up there. Yes, George are. has been working so hard lately. I said, you know what, George, you deserve your summer vacation. So he is our team comedian for sure. <laughs> All, right, Go ahead, John. All right, so based on Joe's um, discoveries, uh, we were making a second stalactite machine when Joe really excitedly got in touch with us. Uh, modern trans, uh, tra transfer of information is fantastic. So we decided to adapt our stalactite machine to see if we could make the same fossil deposits he made. There it is. You can see we put a drip tray running horizontally down. If you want to see this working, come to our Aussie Creation Museum and have a look at the results of our experiments. Yes, you can see all this all now under beautiful shed cover, but here's some of the things we've done. On the 3rd of the 7th in 2016, when we've just been building this, we installed the ropes, the drip trays in a different way. And it wasn't long. Yes, you can see calcium carbonate crystals forming. You can put them through X-ray diffraction, prove they're the same as in real stalactites, because that's what they are. By the 22nd of the 7th, look at the growth. In fact, you get beautiful pictures as you actually watch drips unfold over themselves. Can you see what it's done? You've had a drip, and then the outside of the drip folds over the inside of the drop. Fantastic stuff. Beautiful photography. We even collected, uh, you know, the bacterial trays, the growth trays, the agar plates, and checked for the bacteria that's inevitably in it in the fastest growing ones. There you will see our drips originally falling onto the bottom, and now we've got them directed. And what did we decide to do? Well, we watched for starters. <laughs> so at the 16th and the AM, we had a bare one. By the time we get to the 16th on the PM, the wind had blown, and we get some leaves blowing in. So we thought, aha, this happens naturally. Of course, it wasn't too long before the wind came along, and the leaves blew out again. So we thought, well, how do we actually get leaves to stay there? Well, by the time we get to the first of the next month, it's very evident, not much wind. Notice that the leaves, we've got some new leaves, but in the time when there was no wind, the lime has formed on the leaves. By the time we get to the 27th of the 7th, you will find that we've got a wonderful tray, and here's how it's working. The drip is coming down right into that area, by the time we get to the 2nd of the 7th, 2017, nearly a year's, uh, six months have gone past rather, notice where that drip has formed. We have formed the nice stalagmite, stalactites. Yes, they hang on tight, but they drip down and stalagmites are drops. But notice one thing, there's been quite a few days where there was no wind and there was enough time for the stalagmite to grow over the leaves. So what Joe saw in a big scale, we are seeing in a little scale. So here's what's happening. Not only do we have a major drip at the left-hand side, we had leaves being trapped on the right-hand side. And the iridescence was unbelievably beautiful. Yes, the light getting into the crystalline calcite. See that calcite that's formed is clear? And look, there's lime forming on the leaves. In fact, by the 9th of the 6th, yeah, don't, don't hear me wrong. The pictures are pretty. Waiting till the 9th of the 6th comes along, 2017, just to see what's happened can be downright boring, but absolutely necessary. And yes, I'm now up to 30,000 photos in this file that we can actually go through. But look, the lime's forming across. In fact, just like Joe found, the leaf is turning to stone. By the time we get to December 2019, we'd started to notice it was looking exactly like there's leaves everywhere. We originally would sort of clean these out, but then we thought, no, let, let's let them blow in. And so we ended up with a leaf that, um, well, skip to the present, June 2022. We took a bit of the bottom stalactite, stalagmite rather, and we broke it off. Go one step further. Can you see what we had noticed a year or so earlier? I deliberately broke it there because my photos showed me 
there should be a leaf inside there. Forgive that phone. I'm in the office at the staff is not here at the moment. I don't even know where the phone is. Excuse me a moment. I'll just have to. Oh, it's been answered. That's good. By the time you get to six years on from when the leaves were put in, can you actually see the bony skeleton of the leaf inside the stalagmite? In fact, August 2016 went from a leaf in the red tray all the way through to a petrified leaf. Now, again, so you notice this is a six-year process. The leaf is hard as rock because it's actually fully impregnated with the lime to the point that you have petrification. All right, there's Wheelie Bridge. There's where Joe was. There's his brother. There's a stalagmite hanging from the top chemically identical and there's your stalagmite chemically identical and look it's got leaves so there's no doubt about it we have duplicated in our artificial environment the fact that joe and his brother found heaps of leaves i mean there's his fossil leaves <coughs> and uh, there is our leaves that joe found beautifully preserved so when you have a look wheelie bridge as joe said had a maximum of 86 years of time to form, but our one only took six years. I'm pretty sure if Joe went 80 years earlier, he would have found the same thing on a smaller scale. Again, it illustrates the point, X-ray diffraction proves this is the same rock. Chemically, it's the same rock. The bacteria are the point that the world is missing. Have the wrong formula, it'll take you the wrong time. Have the right process, you won't get the wrong time. And the key issue, Professor John, said the world is so old that evolution must be true. Why did he have to do that? To him, time was the only God involved, but the real God who didn't need time. Yep, we're quite right. We're back where we started. God said he made the world in six days. How could he do that? Well, when God is the maker, time is out and process is in. Now, I'll repeat that because it's so important. If you leave God out of your chemistry, you are making a serious error. You think you know everything, when in reality, you didn't even know the bacteria got involved in the chemistry. Why did God take six days? Well, he certainly didn't need it. I mean, if you can make a universe in six days, you can take whatever time you like. But he said he made it in six days. And later you learn that he actually had a reason for that. Oh, why have I got Jesus there instead of God? Well, God is the word used in the Old Testament, but this God is the God who became flesh and the New Testament calls him Jesus. And then it says all things were made by him. That's why he didn't take time to turn water into wine. I mean, you can do that, turn water into wine, go for it. But he had the right process. And you and I take a lot longer, even though we use yeast to help us a lot. Jesus didn't need time. He always had the right process. And that's where this whole issue will boil down to. In our question time that's remaining, uh, when uh, George decides to let us have some mocks questions, then you will find that that's what this conflict gets down to. Where do you want to put God when it comes to volcanoes? Were there volcanoes at creation? No hint of them. Were there volcanoes at the flood? There were certainly fountains of the deep, and most of our violent volcanic eruptions are mostly water. Uh, do you put God in your origin of life well professor john wouldn't but then he couldn't explain why animals would keep producing their own kind so there was a precious little fossil evidence now joe may want to talk about jerk he certainly wants to tell us these two things over and over again um test all things hold fast to that which is good now i'm going to stop sharing here and hand back to joe if he wants to that's all cleared guys yes it is all right joe you got anything else you want to share I think it's probably about time that we uh, finish up with some questions. It's sort of half past midnight at my end. Um, we've probably got about another 20 minutes or so of questions to deal with uh, before we need to wrap it up for, for the evening. So uh, if anybody wants to find out more about the Chirk side of research, because we've already had questions about the chemistry of stalactites and stalagmites, well, that's a very important point, don't get us wrong, and John has dealt a big part of that, right? But one thing that we spent is many, many days going through the chemistry of Chert Canal Tunnel. Now, that's uh, nothing to do with the water authority or anything like that. It was actually testing things like the pH. 
testing the presence of crystals, testing to see if there's a way that we could actually show that what was going on in Church Canal Tunnel is very, very similar, if not identical, to what goes on in a cave system. And we found some rather remarkable things. For a start, the chemistry of the cement had completely changed by the time that it was a stalactite. Now, that itself shows you that there's something going on here, which is indeed a process. But if you want to find out about that, you can go on to our Creation Research YouTube you can go and have a look at, uh, I think it's called Chirk Canal Tunnel Destroys Millions or something like that. But if you search Chirk, right, or Chirk Canal uh, or Chirk Canal Tunnel, it'll come up with that. We also did, I think, a Tights and a Mites presentation uh, a few weeks back on Creation Conversations. I don't think we've mentioned Creation Conversations. It's our weekly program, which goes out every Friday evening in the UK time. That's Friday afternoon if you're in the States, or very, very early Saturday morning if you're in Australia. And if you're elsewhere in the world, you'll have to work it out. Um, but basically, we uh, have a program with myself and John, which is how it started. Then it grew to Diane Eager. Then it grew to Sam Jenkins. Then we've just had our newest edition, which is Craig Hawkins from Tasmania. So uh, come along and join us every Friday. But if you go to our YouTube channel where we have Creation Conversations, you'll be able to find not only the Church Canal Tunnel bit that we put together, but you'll also be able to find um, a uh, whole uh, mini thing that we did on um, Wheelie Bridge and the static type that we found there. And uh, pretty soon we're coming out uh, a slightly longer documentary which we've put together dealing with all of it together. So um, keep an eye out for that. John? One little, one little commercial before you go, Joe. Um, we have all of the stuff that our friendly skeptic asked about the kinetics and the chemistry. You'll find it full of pictures and full of references to both the skeptic sites and uh, all of these things are all in there, all documented for you, both with words, references and pictures. And at a level, the ordinary person can understand and repeat the chemistry, if you like. In our new museum in Tasmania, Craig has set up a lovely stalactite machine. He's even willing to tell you how he copied my big stalactite machine. And it, Joe, I believe in your new museum, you're going to set up one too? We are indeed, and we're going to go one step further from your original, because I think it's worth saying that your original, you know, giraffe drinking trough um, stalactite machine, that was first designed back in 2015. Now, we actively do research. They've come on many, many, many times since then, right? They'd come on many times since I visited in 2018, and it's gone in even further from that. And so when we produce our stalactite machine, what we'll be doing is modelling off of the latest one in Australia, which is cement trough free because that was one of the criticisms, wasn't it, John, that actually all you're yeah. doing is making a, essentially a bridge where the cement can chemically quickly turn into a stalactite. So you know what we did? We said, well, I wonder if we'll get the same results if we get rid of the cement. And do we get the same results, John? We certainly do. We've done it in Australia. You'll do it even prettier in your new version of the machine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, awesome. George, over to you. All right, awesome. As always, very thorough, comprehensive, and uh, I'll just get up the final questions here as as we uh, you know complete this final portion of the show. So uh, this one comes in from T Rock, and he asks, "Can John list out the key factors that affect rate of growth for stalagmites and stalactites?" Okay, as I've mentioned, one of the invisible factors is the one that I had to conclude based on my father's original metal tanks. Now, many of you around the globe aren't old enough to remember this or your technology in your country was way ahead of what we had in Australia. I grew up with dirt roads, no water. We collected our own water. We had no electricity. We had lamps that ran on, on oil. I know I was born a million years ago and my granddaughter, when she first heard this, she said, Grandpa, when did you see first see your first chariot? Uh, she could not believe that uh, Australia only 50 years ago used to be what many people regard as so backwards, so behind the scenes. But in reality, it meant you got to see a lot of things that most people don't see today. So my job was to clean the tank, as I said. Now, that's where I got the idea from about the bacterial load, because the frogs would dissolve, the spiders would dissolve, the leaves would dissolve, the junk would settle on the bottom, <coughs> that the metal in the tank would crack 
eventually metal doesn't last forever even though it's galvanized and you would then get inside and coat the whole lot with a cement coating now in a little while it would begin to leak again and a white stain would come down the outside and it would proceed to grow now because i was the guy who cleaned the tank i observed all of this and i was quite surprised when i went to university and they said don't touch the stalactites they take so long to grow and i thought two and two make four something's wrong here they are not including something that's where i first got the idea from if you want to do this you need to include the bacterial component now i've collected lots of limestone over the year to see what's in it no i don't go around bashing stalactites in commercial caves or uh, that sort of thing there are many that have fallen down at the front the animals knock them over and joe's got them from historical sources so we can investigate the stalactites but we can investigate the limestone and not trouble because usually where there's lots of caves there's big quarries okay there's bacteria stuff to provide food for the bacteria in that limestone. I have found fossil plants in, in right down in the geologic column in the limestone in Tennessee. Plants equals bacterial food. So if you've got water coming down, bacteria are so tiny, they come down through the cracks, they can actually generate acid as a result of digesting the plants. It gets into the water, does a way better job than just water plus CO2. So you need some sort of organic source. You need, well, cracking helps if you want to bring the water down, but you will find that the uh, factors are limestone, calcium carbonate, fossil rich limestone, uh, organic content that's in the limestone and a source of bacteria. And that's what we've done. Joe, you've, you've seen our stalactite machine. That's yeah. really what we've got. Mulch, we've, we've made a swamp. Why did we put the swamp at the top? I was investigating the caves halfway up Western Australia and they were doing really well on the edge of the desert. I thought, what's going on here? Then as I checked the soil, it was red, red all the way up, right up most of the West Coast. It used to be highly forested, high rainfall. You go into the caves, massive stalactites, but very slow growth. The massive stalactites came from when the forest was very active. That's what I've seen on the East Coast. Active forest, lots of bacteria, active growth. No forest, dry, no growth. It's not just the water, though. Like we found in the Nullarbor, you add the grass, you add the water, your stalactites and stalagmites start regrowing. So key factors, find a bacterial source. In fact, can I encourage you, if you want to do this commercially, then you actually probably need to find the best bacteria maker of organic acids and joe and i were unbelievably amazed when we chatted to the professor at st andrews and he told us about this minus two ph acid that was generated by the bacteria and what they were trying to use it for is almost like a, a an organic um, oxyacetylene torch quite quite incredible so you need a bacterial source you need a bacterial food supply you need lime calcium carbonate and you need water Drop any one of those and you'll have real trouble growing both the stalactites and the caves. Joe, want to add anything to that? Yeah, going back to the process thing, right, we've spoken a lot about the biological necessity, and that is extremely important. But don't underestimate the importance of water and uh, what's actually in the water and the amount of water that you have. Case in example, the Kalavavari in the Czech Republic, which is carrying a natural mineral called aragonite, which is a form of calcium carbonate. It produces incredible amounts of deposition and you can permineralize all sorts of weird and wonderful things, including paper roses and teddy bears and everything, right? But just purely naturally, so that's without any form of like... Um, you know, artificially hanging a teddy bear underneath the stream, you get enormous water fountains that produce almost what looks like a flowing water, you know, flowing limestone uh, kind of um, um, flowing limestone sculpture kind of thing, right? Because as the water flows, it deposits that mineral, right? So you've got these flowing minerals. You'll find that with your water pipes, it builds up layers and layers and layers and layers of this material. Now, if I've traveled in caves all over the world, my favorite cave still to go into are Cheddar Gorge Caves, most specifically Goff's Cave down in, uh, in Somerset, right? Absolutely beautiful. And what you'll find down there is you've got what looks exactly like a flowing limestone 
you know, waterfall almost, where the water has clearly been flowing at some time in the past and it's deposited that mineral as it's been flowing. And that's what the signs openly admit. Look at our limestone waterfall, our cave waterfall made out of solid rock. Back in the time, they say, when the water was flowing more and you had the water flowing down and depositing the limestone. And you think, wow, that's wonderful. And then you walk further into the cave and they talk about the, how these stalactites and stalagmites form. And they say, based on our current observation rates of these stalactites and stalagmites, it must have taken hundreds of thousands of years. Well, I'm sorry, you've got a contradiction there. You already admitted earlier that conditions were different because you had more water in the cave, right? Different conditions can produce different stuff. If you're going to take today's observations and use them to interpret the past, what you are doing is falling for the same Lyellian principle, um, which con Giles Darwin and actually kick-started the modern phenomena of a belief in an old earth where the present is the key to the past. Everything we observe today has always been happening. Therefore, you can trust today to interpret the past. Now, if you do that, it doesn't matter about your chemistry. It doesn't matter about really any kind of, you know, um, experiments you do on it. If you're going to take that perspective, you will always come out with a date of millions of years. Um, but remember what scripture says, it's not the present that's the key to the past, it's the past that's the key to the present. You need to get the big picture and when you step back and begin to consider, well, hang on, we already know that conditions were different in the past. I wonder what other factors could affect this as well. That's when the world begins to really open up to you. Um, John, any final comments? Yeah, uh, just to, um, it occurred to me from some of the questions that people are thinking about the heat energy and all of that involved in here experiments with gases tell you one thing if the gas dissolves in the water and that's part of your process which it is right making carbonic acid if you heat the water up say from a volcanic source or whatever the gas is forced out and you'll reduce the acidity of your water if you heat the whole thing now i've seen a cold cave in romania where you could go into it and i say cold because there's no doubt about it carbon dioxide is bubbling up from underneath at a volcanic source despite the climate change gurus telling us carbon dioxide is the world's worst thing it's actually given off more by volcanoes than it is by people so in this cave you have hot co2 hot rocks bubbling up through colder and colder rocks until finally there's a cave there with water flowing through it you can dip your cup in and have your carbonic tonic water right? It's natural carbonated water. And we didn't invent anything. God thought of that one first, but it really is nice to actually drink. So if you add heat to this process, sorry, you're blowing it. It's going to form a normal, cool cave type temperature, 15 to 20 degrees max. Otherwise you lose your CO2. The other thing that you might want to think about, because we've got quite a few creationists here, if you actually try to make or try to reconstruct the world up to Noah's day, then I'm pretty sure Adam didn't have too many caves to go into because a limestone is a, a result of a depositional uh, process. And if you start your world, put Adam on, on day six, it's going to be a while before you have any chemically deposited carbon, uh, calcium carbonate. Yes, most of our limestone is chemically deposited. Put that in your, your actual model. But having organically deposited calcium carbonate is going to be significantly longer and flood type, except for two things. Remember I mentioned caves that form in reefs? These could have formed even before Noah's flood. Now, don't think of the Great Barrier Reef as lasting for millions of years because you too can watch David Attenborough's program on the Barrier Reef where the local natives said, we used to live out there beyond the reef. And then the water came in real suddenly. It's a recent formation, but it's still got caves in it, right? No more than 10, 12,000 years old, even using the Aboriginal data, uh, which is you know, non-time metric. <laughs> they, they either have now or, or the dream time. But you find Adam perhaps could have visited uh, limestone caves in coral reefs. And perhaps he could have visited, you know, the uh, stromatolites that still grow living fossils because they're made of a limey material mixed with bacterial stuff and they could possibly form caves in fact i've been in many limestone quarries where you can see tons and tons of uh, stromatolites and i've collected an awful lot of them and they are potentially cave makers 
before Noah's flood because they were one of the few things along with corals that could have fossilized without a worldwide flood. Donnie? Awesome. I appreciate that answer. Why don't we do one more question? And then as always, time is flying by with you gentlemen. Uh, John Mackay, you have an appointment and Joe, it's very late for you. So we'll get one a final question. And again, I do want to thank the audience for always being so engaged in, in these topics. And, uh, you know, I, I love all the questions that come in. So um, actually, before we get to this one, uh, there is a question here from Purple Euphoric, who's who's asking, anyone know where I can get a copy of the um, John Mackay, the Creation Guys booklet on his findings or somewhere I can get it? So I'm, I'm guessing through your website that I have linked, uh, John. Yes, uh, Joe, in England, you provide uh, the uh, stalactite book, the tights and mites. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're in Australia, the best thing to do is to go to the Australian shop and uh, purchase it if you're in the usa or the uk the best thing to do is to go to our creation research store.com which you'll find at our uk website and purchase it through there we do ship to the states um with postage but uh, it's significantly cheaper shipping from the uk than it is from australia so uh, that's how we'd recommend you do it we do have an uh, a usa shop i'm not sure whether it's up there or not but uh, we're currently having a bit of a reshuffle and a sort out in the usa with our team and um, pray for Glenn and uh, the family and Bob and Joni and everybody involved over there. But the easiest way of getting hold of it will be through our creationresearchstore.com. Um, yeah. Donnie, when you bring up the next question, John, I'm going to let you start. But what I'm going to do is pull up a few photos because I've just got them yeah. handy here. And I think yeah. that it, it might be quite useful uh, for you to talk mm -hmm. about it. It has indeed got mm -hmm. a picture of you to begin with. So uh, oh, I'll that's let what you I like let you well indeed i'll let you take it from there but where are you well it says where you are here but give us a background to this place okay i'll i'll actually do this are oh, you going to do that okay um carthage tennessee vice president al gore lives just up the road and around the corner right this is a cutting on uh, the highway that you can sort of head straight south on here and turn left to go to eastern tennessee as well as over to the east coast um, Carthage has been there an old town. Notice the rocks here are supposedly 450 million years old. Ordovician, originally named in Wales after the Ordovici people. And the name is put here because these rocks are the same. The fossil shells are the same. Geologist Bob Powell, one of our local men uh, in, in the USA, worked for the uh, Geology Association, worked for the Geological uh, Faculty in, in Tennessee when the government had such a thing, it's abandoned now because they're mostly into dumping <laughs> and catalogue. But geologist Bob Powell uh, actually came with us to this site and Joe and you uh, particularly, uh, have you got some fossils there that we found? Ah, look, can you see the spines on this? Now I'd found these a couple of years before we took Joe there and I'd puzzled over them because they look like thorns. They look like stems on plants with thorns. You can see Joe's little pointer there and my pointer with a red arrow. Uh, we took them for verification to a professor in Canada, a world expert, and there's no doubt about it. He said these are Sordonia. Now, Sordonia is famous as being one of the first plants in the geologic column. In fact, if you can get a bit close to that, you'll see one of the first rocks I found is actually full of the stuff, and it's a flowing deposit. These are curved branches with thorns on them. The professor said, yes, Sordonia. The trouble is we're in Ordovician rocks. And since this question is about the first 80% of the rock, here's how it goes. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, etc. This is right above the Cambrian. Um, do you see the plants with spines? Now to verify this, I went and got heaps of Sordonia from other places, particularly the original Canadian ones. See the thorns? They're spiny little uh, things. And it is Sordonia. Uh, go back one, Joe. Okay. Notice the point I'm making? It's not a popular point. These rocks formed after Adam's sin. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says before Adam, there was no thorns. Uh, thorns and creepers, creepers that hold the plant up, are not spiny enough to do you any damage. But if they go hard, they definitely can form little spikes and spines. Uh, notice that we made a creationist comment. 
these rocks formed after Adam's sin because they got thorns in. They're not 450 million years old at all. Go to the next one now, Joe. I think there's, these are the um, Canadian ones that you Canadian compared them to. Right. The comparison. These are regarded as the oldest plants in the world. Came in Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. That rock is Devonian in Canada. And one thing that upset the professor was that I said, well, I'm sorry, these didn't come from Devonian rocks. They came from Ordovician rocks. And his response was, wow, a new discovery? No, sorry. His response was, then you've, mis you've mislabeled the rock. I said, well, you tell that to the Tennessee Division of Geology because it's marked as Ordovician on every one of the rocks and you can follow it up all the way to Canada and it's always Ordovician. Ah, did you catch what I, I just said? He labelled his rocks on the basis of the fossils that are in them. So if he found Sordonia, he definitely said, this is 350 million years old. But our rock was actually older on the geologic column series than his. So that we were actually, well, what's our next one say, Joe? There's his rock. You can see the spines. There's a geologic column. Now, if you look down through the list there, you will find all the names, Precambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician. The question about the 80%, and we'll come to that. But there's the whole geologic sequence right up to the Pleistocene. The first fern were found in the Devonian. Ours are found in the Ordovician. But the Ordovician is way lower on the geologic columns idea than the Devonian. So if the professor had been honest, he would have said, congratulations, guys, you've now got the oldest plants on the planet. Instead, he said, you need to remark it as Devonian because there weren't any plants that far down in the geologic column. Well, there really were. In fact, next one, Joe, I think there's one more there. We've got a world record, and that's probably the best place to stop that, Joe, and I'll go back to the question now. We have found uh, thorns from the Ordovician all the way up to, well, Joe, you found some in Tennessee, correct? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Went back there with Bob and the whole team. I found thorns in the, in the Ordovician. You even found some in Australia, correct? I did. That was a real, I beat you in that one. You did beat me in that one. There's no doubt about it. But we won't play Joe versus John competitions. We'll make a very simple point. The question asks, how do you explain the first 80% of the fossil record contain only single-celled marine organisms that show no sign of land animals or plants? Let's deal with some facts here. When you say 80% of the fossil record, okay, you go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you're in Precambrian. You then have a Cambrian section, not very thick. Then you have not all the geologic column until you get up the top at the Angel campground up there and then you go a little bit further where you've got the big sandy desert sort of rocks sitting all the way through there and then you're still only halfway up the geologic column but if you say 80 percent of the fossil record then mostly you turn out to not really know what you're talking about because i've got to ask you 80 percent of what do you mean the geologic column that's in montana where we can show you well there's more than 80 percent of that one missing if you believe the Grand Canyon is the biggest geologic column in the world, I've been there, I've walked up and down many times, and there's more than 90% of that that's not actually there. So your percentages are very vague, very useless, and no help at all in making a claim like this. The first 80% of the fossil record contains only single cell. Well, let's assume uh, that we can go up the geologic column. Let's start at the Grand Canyon, and here's what I'd recommend you do. Many years ago, a professor from a Canadian university sent me a list of papers on the world's oldest fossil specimens of plant flower-bearing pollen. Now, they are available. Go to our website, look up plant pollen, look up plant land plants, and you will discover they've been actually discovered and published in scientific papers on what was there in the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian of the Grand Canyon. So the statement is simply a wrong statement. Go and have a look at our fossil footprints that I found in the Grand Canyon. You'll be amazed uh, at what is actually there that's not in the textbooks. Joseph, that's a good place for you to take over if you want to say something before your time runs out and mine does too. Yeah, well, the reason that I brought up the uh, fossil thorns, right, is because here you have a, 
a, per a supposed period of time, which is not how the original geologists understood it. They understood these as rock types, right? Um, that's interesting to study a history of geology because before Lyell really introduced the concept of uh, deep time into people's thinking, these rocks were cl classified based on the rocks, right? Not based on the uh, supposed age or evolutionary history of what was in the rocks. I mean, you could match sequences up across the planet, and that is a really useful thing still to do, right? Whereas now, well, you saw the professor's reaction, oh, there's no way that they could be those rocks, even though they're traced all the way down, all the way up. Um, there's no way it could be just because of my understanding of evolutionary history. And the point is, number one, never underestimate how big a bias will affect your thinking or your interpretation or your claims. I mean, I don't know where you've got your uh, reference from, 80% of the fossil record. John's dealt with some of that. It'd be useful to have a reference. But uh, the point is, if even a professor couldn't accept that a rock type was still a rock type because of one fossil that was found in it, then you've got yourselves a big problem. Um, the reason why we wanted to bring that up is because here is an obvious example of a plant fossil, a land plant, hard fossil, right? They're completely different to the soft wibbly wobbly fossil plants like the seaweeds and so on and so forth. This is a hard land plant which is found in a marine deposit buried next to seashells, a supposed I mean, it's something like 40 million years, isn't it, John, before they were supposedly evolved? Um, what it shows is that your entire understanding of the geological column is wrong. Now, I would recommend that you go back and watch what we did with Standing for Truth last time, talking about, well, it started off as flood boundaries, but in order to get to flood boundaries, we had to deal with the whole pretty much history of geology, as well as the way that rock layers form. Now, when you start to view the world that way, all of a sudden your geological column becomes redundant. It is pointless. It is worthless. There really is no proper way of understanding the rock based off of a column which grows up through time. I mean, if you want to classify rocks by rock type, then go for it. It's a great thing. That's what they were originally designed to do, right? Jurassic rocks are the rocks named after the Jura Mountains because they were all like the rocks in the Jura Mountains and so on and so forth. But if you're viewing it purely as a, you know, ascension through time, you're going to run into the same problems over and over again. You can't find that picture of geology anywhere on the planet, not even in the Grand Canyon, which is supposedly our best example of the geological column. As John said, you're missing a vast amount of it. Joe, John, I appreciate that very thorough answer. And I was just thinking that flood boundaries event, that was incredibly comprehensive. I do recommend everybody in the chat, especially if you're new to this channel, please check that out. I do have it linked in um, in the description box. You can either find part one, ones and two separately, or we've also linked them together as, as one solid video as well. That's just five hours long. It's a must watch. And it, it covers all of this in, in great detail. So, okay, well, we're going to wrap it up there. It's been a ton of fun. Gentlemen, I want to hand it over to you for final words, yeah. final thoughts. Donnie, I'll just add before Joe finishes off, because I know he's been up for 14, 15 hours, 16 hours straight. Um, we have a book called Questions and Answers about Creation Evolution. It is available in many countries. Check on the website. But if you want a lot of the information we've done tonight and a lot more, we have a free source uh, called Q&A. So if you go to creationresearch.net, you will find there's a Q&A button. Hit the Q&A and many of the questions that have come in tonight have some sort of version of the same question in, in the book, as well as a more ex extensive version in the Q&A section. Or go search the fact file. We've in compiling this, Dr. Diane Eager, who does a wonderful job uh, doing our newsletters, doing our actual post out on Q&A. We had a free electronic post out yesterday. So if you want to receive that, go to newsletters free. You can all afford free even after three years of COVID. So what you find <laughs> is go to uh, Q&A or go to fact file, look up pollen, look up um, plants in rocks, look up thorns, and you'll find a very, very helpful source. And uh, it's been great being with you again, George. Joseph, final comments? 
<laughs> I'm just going to follow up by um, saying we've got a, a new program coming out shortly, which is sort of an accumulation of lots of different little things uh, which we've been working on. And it does indeed deal with those stalactites and stalagmites. So keep an eye out for that coming out shortly. We've got loads of great things over on our YouTube channel, including something that we are uh, bringing to a, a new project. We're going to inve be investigating things like membership. Sam is investigating things like a creation research app and stuff stuff like that which accumulates all of our streaming and everything else so keep watching for there if anybody's in the uk and would like to uh, support us and uh, help us with a big move and everything else with our new museum project get in touch online and uh, give us help give us support and god bless and see you next time Good on awesome you. great final words gentlemen again thank you so much for your time i know how busy you both are and please to the audience consider uh supporting the amazing work being done by the creation research team all relevant links are in the description box please check that out and god bless all thanks for tuning in standing for truth is out